Lorna's, uh, Lorna's speech reflected on our, our past as well as looking forward and talking about the journey that we've all been on together. I guess uh, I've been thinking about that quite a lot recently as well. My journey started when I was taken along to Green Party branch meetings as a, as a child, back when my mum was an activist and a candidate. If my favourite time traveller bundled me off into the TARDIS and, and took me back to those days, would my younger self have believed that I'd be one of the first green ministers in this country, taking on the responsibility to invest billions of pounds in making our transport and energy systems greener? I just don't know. Or maybe the TARDIS would have dropped me off back in the 90s when I first moved to Glasgow. I had a, a low-paid temping job and a landlord who wouldn't give me a contract. That ended uh, with him turning up with a, a bunch of guys to start removing furniture and, and fixtures and fittings from the, the flat and turfing me out. Sadly, today, land like that, landlords like that do still exist. I'd love to go back in time and tell my younger self, Patrick, one day you'll be the minister for tenants' rights and you'll be able to stop this. You'll establish a new deal for tenants. That applause is for all of you because, conference, it's your work delivering our best ever election result, which has given us the chance to set a historic wrong to rights. Margaret Thatcher got rid of rent controls. We'll be bringing them back. We, uh, we are on a journey, though, because... Conference, although we've been talking for decades about a just transition, about equality and human rights, and about a well-being economy, the rest of the country is now catching up. The extraordinary challenges of the last 18 months have shone a light on a broken economy and a failed social fabric, uh, all while the climate, climate crisis has become more and more visible. The frustration that we feel at the lack of past progress on those things can now be channeled into action. On the streets and the doorsteps, our work creates an urgent call for change, just as we've always done for nearly 50 years of our movement's history, 30 of our own party's history. In Parliament, we're bringing constructive challenge into politics and providing a voice for the communities we represent, just as we've done since 1999. And now, in government, we're now turning rhetoric into action. Now more than ever, thanks to the hard work of our members and campaigners, the Scottish Greens are working for Scotland. And now more than ever, Scotland needs us. It's the most disadvantaged people in our communities who felt the impact of the pandemic most keenly. And that's why we're putting inequality at the heart of the recovery strategy. Only this week, there were major announcements that show green leadership. First, as, as Lorna mentioned, this week, workers in social care got a pay rise, a key part of the cooperation deal. It takes them above the living wage and matches for the first time uh, the pay of people working in the NHS. Throughout the pandemic, we have championed higher pay in this sector because these workers have been on the front line and deserve to be valued. We made it a shared priority, made quick progress, but make no mistake, this is just the first step toward giving care work the value it deserves. Because we must... <laughs> because we must, as a society, recognize those who really contribute to our collective well-being. We have to build a recovery that leaves no one behind. The policy program that we've secured will last throughout this term of parliament. Some of it will be delivered quickly, and some will take longer. But both Lorna and I have already been extremely busy working on our priorities, and we've already made progress. Uh, for example, this week, as Minister for Zero Carbon Buildings, I announced the first allocations 
of at least £1.8 billion of investment toward funding the energy transformation that we need. We're doubling the funding for upgrading public sector buildings like hospitals and schools to £200 million, lowering their carbon footprint. And we're also doubling the funding for upgrading social housing to £200 million as well, making it warmer and cheaper to run. Like the, the tower blocks that I visited in Springburn this week, where banks of heat pumps now give warmth and a 60% cut in bills to hundreds of households. This support for people to switch from expensive gas boilers to sustainable alternatives could not be more urgent at a time when the spike in fossil fuel prices will be pushing more and more people into fuel poverty. It's clear this is an investment our whole society must make. And it's an... In <laughs> and it's an investment as well that's going to create... 16,400 jobs by the end of this decade alone and will make a difference in every community right across Scotland. From energy efficiency to heat pumps to district heating, these will cut fuel poverty and Scotland's climate emissions. And a national public energy agency will provide leadership and can harness the potential of scaled up programmes to decarbonise heat, including helping communities and local government to increase public ownership in our energy system. Conference, I know that you will be impatient for change. You understand the urgency, and so do I. We're only just getting started. As Lorna described, we've got so much more coming to create jobs, progress equality, and to restore and protect our environment in the years to come. Our shared program in government is about creating a green recovery from the pandemic that tackles the climate and nature emergency. So as well as action on warm homes, we're also going to be transforming Scotland's transport systems. We'll step up the electrification of the network helped by the £5 billion of investment that we'll deliver for Scotland's railways. And ScotRail itself is coming back into public ownership just in time for our Fair Fares review, which will set out how we can most effectively cut the cost of public transport across the country. Of course, that's something that we started even before we were in government. From January, uh, this uh, young people will be able to travel on the bus for free thanks to the work the Scottish Greens did in the last session. And as we shift transport policy away from the private car, our transformational uplift in funding for walking, wheeling and cycling will make a real difference too. Scotland has seen a depressing return to traffic congestion and pollution as people get back to work. But we can tackle this by cutting the need for travel with 20-minute neighbourhoods, making sure public transport is available, reliable and affordable everywhere, and making walking and cycling the safe and easy choice for everyone. And we're going to do just that. In government, the Scottish Greens will be shifting investment away from building ever more space for cars and instead achieving a huge increase in active travel infrastructure. And that ambition doesn't only apply to cities either. In my first month in the job, I had the pleasure of opening the new Bowline Active Travel Project at Bowling Harbour in Western Berkshire. Its completion not only means that walking, wheeling and cycling on the Glasgow to Loch Lomond route will be protected from a busy road, the community will also see social and economic benefit from putting a piece of neglected built heritage back to good use. We can deliver so many more of these transformational projects, and that's why we've committed to investing at least £320 million, or 10% of the total annual transport budget, on active travel by 24-25. That's almost triple what it is today. Conference, we are working hard for Scotland right now, but we've got big ambitions for Scotland's future too. A Scotland that doesn't just tackle the climate crisis, but leads international efforts for peace and climate justice. As COP26 focuses the world on the climate emergency, we must increase support for the global south and the most vulnerable communities in their efforts to tackle the impacts 
they're already feeling. That's why Scotland's Climate Justice Fund will increase to £6 million a year, providing £24 million across this parliament. Let's not pretend that's enough. Greens have always been clear that the argument for independence is about Scotland playing a more positive role in the world. Instead, at the moment, we're forced to spend our energies dealing with a UK government that's desperate to look inwards, savagely cutting international development funding, ignoring climate science, and undermining Scotland's parliament. We look at the empty supermarket shelves delivered by Brexit, the people struggling to make ends meet after the biggest benefit cut since the creation of the welfare state. We look at the threat to rip up devolution so the Tories can tarmac over Scotland with road building plans and stick a union flag on it. We look at a government using the courts to prevent the Scottish Parliament from upholding the rights of children. And we look at a Prime Minister who says, never mind lowering life expectancy or cancer outcomes, because he's totally, mindlessly devoted to his own shameless self-interest above everything, above lives, above the planet. Conference, we look at these horrors and we, we, we know we must defend our homes from these extremists. Whether our... <laughs> And that's, that's true whether our home means our planet, our country, or the roof over their head. There's, there's hardly anything more important than home. And conference, as I said uh, at the start, I know what it's like to be thrown out of your home. Throughout the pandemic, we have pushed for protections for those who face that. We know that far too many people are still living in rented homes that are insecure, inexpensive, and do not meet their needs. That's why it means so much to me to be able to deliver a new deal for tenants in government. That process starts by speaking to the people who are struggling to pay their rent now. I'll be working with the Joseph Rowntree Foundation on this, hearing directly from tenants on low incomes to help shape our rented sector strategy. I've already started speaking to organizations like Living Rent to hear about their experience of insecure housing and how they've organized against abusive landlords. The Greens know that homes are more than bricks and mortar. Decent housing is a human right, and it's critical to our health, our well-being, and our life chances. So in government, the Scottish Greens will ensure that tenants' voices are at the heart of our work to ensure that everyone has better, safer, and fairer housing. My younger self wouldn't have believed it. If I could go back in time... Uh, it, would be, it would be amazing. If we could go back to the 80s or 90s, we could make the world listen to the warnings of the green movement. If we did that, the changes that the world needs to make could have been done more slowly and far more easily. But time travels the stuff of science fiction. We are faced with the here and now. And in this moment, we have a short window of opportunity to make the changes that have been put off for far too long. Those changes must be fair, but they must also be fast, as fast as the science demands. If we want a chance of a decent future, the Greens are exactly where we need to be, in government, building a sustainable, greener, fairer future together. So conference, our journey has only just begun. Thank you very much. <laughs>